put on the video voice. All right, folks, we are looking at uh, module two here, which is uh, referred to as chapter two inside of our unit one folder for our class. Um, as I mentioned just before the video started, I, I don't plan on hitting every single slide here. There's 47 slides. I'd certainly put all of you to sleep uh, pretty quickly if I hit every slide and talked about every bullet point. My objective is to hit certain highlights that I consider important um, because this is really kind of what I call an introductory kind of like cybersecurity course. Um, some of the concepts and terminology are kind of important. So like, you know, I can make the naive assumption that maybe you guys have heard the terminology before or uh, maybe even some of you are well versed in it, but very concretely, I know that some of you completely are not or maybe you've heard certain things and, and really don't fully understand them. So my, my objective here is to really kind of clarify the concepts, meanings, and, and terminology and talk about, I think, some important foundational concepts. Um, another really important thing is as you kind of delve into this course, you know, you'll see that this is material that comes from CompTIA and this is the Security Plus. And what this is really kind of fascinating aspect of this is CompTIA is uh, an agency in IT, and I think that's the right word, um, that issues a lot of certifications to people that work in the IT industry. So anybody that, like, for example, works in the hardware field often studies the CompTIA IT Essentials, and, we, and, and any of you that are in our programs know that we also have the IT Essentials course, which is also built on the CompTIA curriculum, which basically if you go through the material and study it really well, you can go sit for the official certification from CompTIA and earn a Security Plus certificate, which has value in the field. It, it is a base level certificate, but as you'll see, the topics are pretty deep in this course. And, and I always think about, you know, hey, this is kind of a first semester course in most programs or second. Um, so it, it's pretty heavy material in some cases, um, but it's totally doable. Uh, unfortunately, the course is not set up where you uh, take this course and you get your certificate. That's not how it works. You, if you really want to sit for the certificate, by the way, you'd probably want to do a bunch of additional study, like after the course is done, um, sign up for practice exams with CompTIA, and then if you guys are curious about where you can take that certification test, well, here's the news. Gateway is the official IT testing station in all three counties in which we serve. So in uh, the Kenosha main campus, the Racine main campus, and the Elkhorn main campus have testing centers where you can sit and take this official certif certification for industry and a whole bunch of others, right? Um, and so this is really the material that CompTIA publishes to prepare you for those exams. Anybody who's really ser serious about doing cybersecurity in particular as a degree path um, really should consider sitting for that certification. There are many organizations that will hire you just based on that certificate alone, believe it or not. So uh, worthy to mention. All right. So this, this particular chapter has these uh, topics, you know, so we're going to look at pen testing, rules of engagement, scanning, basically, and different resources. And, and hopefully by the end of the class, we'll be exploring some of those things online uh, and completing some of the homework. All right, so penetration testing, and, and in the industry, by the way, we usually call this pen test, you know, or pen testing, um, because penetration is such a long, hard word to say. Um, but what, in essence, it is, is the act of trying to compromise computer resources to see where the flaws are in the security. You know, and it's done intentionally, right? So like, uh, for example, if I set up a network or a server or computer, uh, penetration testing would be an attempt to bypass its security measures and get into the file system, for example. Um, you know, the way that you do it um, is really kind of dependent upon what kind of organization you're involved with and their policies. So for example, um, this has become a significantly more important issue within the last 10 years than it ever was in the past. We used to actually have a running joke when I first started in IT uh, and well, the operating systems that we, we were supporting at the time, just to give you kind of perspective, 
was DOS 3.0, you know, that was the operating system. And then we made this big leap into Windows 3.11, which was the network version of Windows. And then we went to 95 and 98 eventually and then switched to XP on the desktop. But during that era, especially up through the Windows 98 era, it was considered an absolute joke, the security level that was available on Windows and PC platforms. Basically, there was no security. In Windows 95 or 98, for example, if you went into the operating system, you'd be presented with a login screen, if you even set it up, that would have you enter the password to get in. And there was an OK button and a cancel button. So if I didn't know the password, you just hit cancel, you're in the system as an admin. You know, there was no security, right? Basically, it was kind of a, a joke. Um, entering the password, though, did give you access to certain network resources, but that's kind of a whole separate thing. All right, so it, it does say here, it says the first most important element in a pen test is planning, like figure out how you're going to do it, it is really kind of a necessary first step. Um, it can really raise a lot of issues, right? So if I was on campus trying to teach you how to do a penetration test, the last thing I would want to do, for example, is like try to do that on one of the gateway servers that's operating important services on campus, you know, like network shares or internet access or the registration system, for example. That would be a big no-no. Um, and here's kind of a really interesting little tidbit for all of you. Um, in the early days of doing the cybersecurity class when we started, and it wasn't, you know, that long ago, um, we were teaching penetration nesting, testing on the live network at Gateway. And guess what happened to our, our cybersecurity instructors? They got in trouble. The IT department's like, all these red flags are flying. Hey, we got people trying to like hack our network, you know, uh, and we're shutting down all the workstations and we're turning off network access. And, you know, it was pretty severe. So what ended up happening is we worked out an agreement with them where when you're in the networking classrooms at the Elkhorn campus um, or at uh, the Racine campus, this is not true at IMET where we are holding our classes. They are on isolated network se segments with their own network connections going out to the internet. So we can practice hacking and penetration testing without disturbing any of the campus systems and freaking out our IT people. Because that's basically what we do is we really freak them out, you know. Um, you know, and there's a lot of aspects. So it says the, the most dangerous result of poor planning is creating unnecessary legal issues. So can you imagine in a place where we value people's private information, you know, like HIPAA, FERPA, all that stuff, that the possibility of like compromising somebody's privacy and security is pretty extreme, you know. Uh, I'm really careful to make sure I don't ever put people's grades up on the screen so that other people can see what score you're getting. Um, all right, so why, why do you do this? Well, you do it to, to see what the problems are, because once you identify what the problems are, then you can fix them, right? Um, so how do, you, how do you know what the problems are? Well, there's certain attacks that are, are pretty common. Um, all right, who, who should perform the test? This gets kind of interesting. Ideally, um, you would have people in-house that would do it. Gateway does have those people, um, you know, and I've been thinking um, some of them are actually pretty good friends of mine, you know, and to the point, you know, where we, you know, uh, get together outside of the work environments and talk and, and hang out and stuff. And I've been thinking I might invite a couple of them in as a guest to class to talk about some of these issues, if you guys are all amiable to that, because there's nothing better than hearing it from a person that's actually doing the work on what their job entails so that when you go out and do it, you're kind of more prepared and in tune. Um, so we actually have people on staff in our IT department that are cybersecurity people, right? That's their job title, you know, and, and I don't know if they're like a cybersecurity specialist or technician or what their formal title is, but because they're on the network, they're always monitoring the network, pen testing the network, all of those issues. However, you notice that they have some disadvantages to this, you know, they're internal, so they know, you know, they're on staff, you know, probably cheaper to hire somebody than to, you know, go out and contract somebody. However, because they're internal, sometimes they're at a disadvantage because 
maybe they don't know the latest hacking techniques because they're not out hacking, you know, or because, um, you know, like if they do find a problem, so I want you to think about this, they're the ones who supposedly set up the security, but then they found a problem with the way they set it up and they might be like, I'm just going to fix this really quick and not tell anybody, right? So this is kind of a, a practical thing. The other option is you can hire out, right? So you can hire people to come in and, you know, people that do this on a professional basis sometimes have more sophisticated sets of tools and because they, they help a wide variety of clients are exposed to more types of threats and so are better equipped to identify the weaknesses that you have. However, there's some really big disadvantages in, okay, so if you're going to let somebody try to enter your network or try, you know, to gain access, what if they access actual sensitive information, right? And what if that information is financial or um, company trade secrets or whatever? And you know what? That's a whole racket too. So there's a lot of people who get into this game and do exactly that. They'll come in and, and do the, the testing uh, and then they'll also steal information and sell it to others, you know, um, or leave back doors. Yeah, so it, it, it's kind of a, a, a thing. So if you're hiring an external company, you gotta make sure they're really, really good. Um, here's a, an interesting uh, term, bug bounty, you know? And so this is a, you know, when you actually get paid for finding a bug, right? And I don't know if you guys have ever done that with a piece of software. Has anybody ever like filed like a bug report for, you know, a uh, software, a website? Becky, I see you nodding. What, what did you, what did you do it for? Video games. Okay. Yeah. Like, Hey, I clicked on this thing and it didn't work. Right. It or, didn't transport me. I didn't get my loot. What the heck? <laughs> right. Okay. So, and I don't know how like companies reward, but, um, that is kind of a thing. You ask your own users to point things out. Um, I think that people that tend to do that kind of reporting though, you know, report bugs are people who are technically usually more in the know or want to be, you know, so they're, it's usually the techie types that are doing that. All right, skipping a couple of slides here. All right, so next topic is this thing called rules of engagement. So like, in, in other words, if you're gonna try to compromise the system to figure out its flaws, you have to have kind of figured out like a, a procedure for doing so. And uh, here's kind of a quick bullet list of like, you know, how you're gonna do it. And, and there's a bunch of slides that follow here kind of talking about each one. So let's just kind of skip down. Um, first of all, you gotta look at when you do this. If you're gonna try to compromise a network. So for example, if I was to try to do this at, at Gateway to figure out what's wrong with our network, I wouldn't wanna do it like, for example, while classes are running you know or um at the beginning of a semester or something like that you know we're, we're relying on our systems real heavily um and you know we have had issues in the past you know in fact when we started our fall semester um in the web department so i'm i'm mostly a web teacher um and our web servers were down and what had happened is we had power outages and then you know the ups systems failed and you know et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but when you do it is important. Um, you also have to figure out what are you what are you testing? You know, are you going to test to see if somebody can hack from the inside the company or from outside the company or um, like Gateway, which is a complex environment. We have our own uh, privatized wide area network where all the campuses connect together. We might go do an attack from one campus to another or from outside that whole network to see if we can compromise it. Um, so a lot of considerations uh, on that. Um, in some cases, you're just not allowed to do this. You say, no, we're not going to let you try to compromise your security. Um, so you might have to get, um, you know, sign contracts or get formal approval from upper level management. Um, and then there's the amount of testing that you do as well. Like at at what point, <clears throat> how far do you take it is really kind of the, the question. Um, another thing is, is how do you communicate all that information? I think that's kind of a no brainer, honestly. And then after the process of it all, where do you end up? Are you, um, are you, did you leave a mess? 
You know what I mean? So in other words, it's kind of like if you invite a contractor into your home to do something, you know, to paint your house, did they leave like, you know, paint scrapings everywhere and drips everywhere or did they clean it up? And the same happens uh, with IT. So for example, if you find, for example, that, hey, all your desktops need to have an OS patch to fix this vulnerability, do you actually do that? You know, or are you just suggesting to somebody to do that? Different levels of doing that. And ultimately, usually we want to see some sort of reporting on it. Um, I think this is kind of interesting, right? you know, this, this graphic, right? They talk about the different types of vulnerability by types. And, and, I, and I want you to look at how large a percentage of this is missing patches, which typically is you didn't upgrade your software or you didn't upgrade, um, well, actually this, this would be, I'm gonna say missing patches refers mostly to the operating system and software. But, you know, when I look at this, this one, the orange one, lack of hardening the OS, it's like the, the it's a combination of like patching and how you're running the OS in the first place. You know, so for example, when you guys come to one of our labs and log into one of the desktops there, you guys aren't typing in a username and password, are you? You're using the built-in student account. Um, is that secure enough? Should we really be making everybody sign into the domain? And the reality is, is they have a whole strategy worked out. We have a very sophisticated security setup at Gateway. Um, but I think it's pretty interesting. Uh, weak passwords is, is still a continual problem. Um, and then, you know, how people get passwords from you, you know, but in, in most cases, you don't really see a lot of like professionals that secure systems that make mistakes like, you know, the, the network design is poor or um, th that thing, you know, so we'll just move on here. All right number of different ways to do a pen test um, so reconnaissance uh, you know is kind of one of them um, and okay so what does this mean and and this kind of really kind of brings me way back and makes me feel kind of old frankly because um, so I give you kind of an interesting story here when I first uh, purchased the home that I'm living in right now and this is you know pushing on 25 years ago um, it was a old house it was a gut rehab so we had to um, you know, tear out all the walls, new, new electric, new plumbing, new heating, all that stuff. Um, and I thought, you know what, hey, the walls are all open. I'm going to wire this house to the hill. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put like network drops. I'm going to do four drops in every room, you know, one on each wall. Uh, heck, I'm going to put a network jack in the bathroom. I don't know why. That's just, I think it's a good idea, you know, that, you know. And so I bought all this like bundled wiring and, and, and dropped it all in. Um, and then Wi-Fi came out, <laughs> you know, and then Wi-Fi became, because up until that point, it, it was kind of a new technology that wasn't really used and it was unproven and really unsafe and unsecure. And so I was like, the way to do it is you wire it. And now here we are. Oh, yes. A lot of my stuff is hardwired and I do use some of that wiring. But for the most part, most of us are on our laptops or tablets or phones and we're on the Wi-Fi, you know, so that like was kind of silly. But in the old days of Wi-Fi, what was really interesting is so much of it was insecure and they came up with this term war driving which literally was and, and a lot of people would do this as they would just kind of drive around or walk around with their devices see what wi-fi is out there and back in the old days nobody had passwords on their routers and then when they did start putting passwords on them um they were really super easy to hack and here's i don't want to scare you guys but they're still pretty easy to hack Right. Um, in a number of different ways. Um, this is kind of like really kind of advanced now. So that's why they have this like war flying thing. So they have people that basically do it with drones that cruise around and look for signals basically that they might be able to tap into. Believe it or not, even with all the modern versions of routers and Wi-Fi technology that we have now, there's still a lot of people that leave their stuff pretty unsecured rarely do you find one that's completely open um but you do there's a couple in my neighborhood uh for example i don't attach to them uh because what happens like if you attach to like unsecured wi-fi what are, what are you also risking anybody have a thought on that 
Can well, say yeah, to, uh, transmitting your packets, sure. I mean, somebody could, um, you know, potentially capture your information. But often, like, you know, like a really common hack, like if you go to a coffee shop, for example, uh, sometimes people f spin up like fake routers at a coffee shop, which really is connecting to their laptop. And they're just waiting for you to like, go to Google, type in your password or whatever, and they can capture that. Right. And so that that's really kind of an issue. Um, so I'm, I'm always very reluctant, like even when I go to a store, you know, and I'm not getting like a cell signal to tap into their Wi Fi. Um, because a lot of those retail stores often have been hacked. Um, this is one of the real scary stories I, I love sharing is like way back in the old days of Wi Fi, uh, Home Depot used to run all their credit card processing over the same network that they shared their open Wi Fi access with their customers. So people would just sit in the parking lot and capture credit card numbers. Can you believe that? I mean, just just astounding that they would like not have it separated or or, or have some sort of a mechanism, you know, that they didn't even think about it. You know, they, they were just uh, not really looking. Um, all right. So reconnaissance really is like where you're kind of figuring out, you know, you're investigating is really kind of a best way to say it. The actual pen test is when you run software or tools that actually try to gain entry, there are actually specialized operating systems that have those types of tools built in. And um, does anybody know the operating system I'm, I'm mostly referring to? What's, what's, the, what's the, the hacking OS that people use? Is it Kali Linux? Yeah, oh. Kali Linux. Um, and you know, this is actually worthy to bring up on screen here. Um, we don't really dig too deep in this class with this, but cyber students, you guys will get to know this tool well. Uh, here's the website for it. Um, and Kali Linux, and I, and I want you to see how this matches up with our topic, right? You know, real, real strongly. Um, it's built, this OS is a Linux distribution built to hack, right? Now, if you look at this, they'll say that it's the ethical hacking tool but it the unethical hackers use it too and, and i think it's really fascinating so you know the white hat hackers and the black hat hackers both use the same tool to attack each other built into the operating system are tools for hacking passwords wi-fi networks applications etc 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 it's all built right into the os there's nothing to download you might update it, but everything's already in the OS. Most people that run Kali Linux as an OS rarely run it on the host machine. They usually run it as a VM. And I think that's really interesting as well. Um, you know, really important tool in, the, in this industry, by the way. One real interesting little sideline, um, you know, and I don't know how many of you are, you know, like big into watching uh, various TV shows. But a few years back, there was a uh, TV show, and I forget if it was on, you know, I forget, maybe it was, uh, I, I'm forgetting the network name right now. It wasn't one of the big three networks. It was uh, a smaller network, and it was a show called Mr. Robot. Has anybody seen that one as a series? Yeah, I've seen some of it. Yeah, and, and Sam, what, what I think is kind of interesting about that show and you know what, since we're kind of doing the sideline, I guess, because this, this is pretty on, on topic. And what I, I think is really interesting about this TV show, um, it looks like it's on Amazon, if you guys are Amazon Prime people, is as you watch the show, what struck me is some, one of my students told me about it. He says, hey, you got to watch the show. It's really pretty cool. I will tell you, frankly, if you're looking for a show that hits hard and fast, right off the bat, this is not it, right? In fact, it starts just the opposite. It starts really mellow, really kind of dark and depressing and psychological, you know? But it does build up to this like intense, this intensity after a few seasons. But basically this is kind of the protagonist, um, his name is Elliot, who works for a cybersecurity firm. But at night, when he's at home, He's a hacker, right? And he like hacks people's social profiles and computers and whatever. And 
it, it what what fascinated me about the show is the most often you watch shows about these topics and they'll show the computer screens and whatever and it's like that's not real that's not how you do it that's not the right tool that's not the right code that's not the right tool you know all those you know like you know it's it just like they're just silly screens they put up like you watch like the 24 tv series and they have all this like stuff scrolling and none of it is real this show right on the first episode i think he was either like rooting a phone or cracking wi-fi or something like that and i was looking at the screen and going oh my god he's using cal oh my god that's exactly oh my god that's exactly how you do it you know and they were showing the actual screens and the actual code in the tv show i was completely flabbergasted and the other part that flabbergasted me about it was it was at the end of the show when they like put up the production screens anonymous was one of the production credits you know and if you guys are familiar with that that's you know one of those hacking things very interesting show though in a lot of different ways uh it has a lot of tie-ins to reality um they of course change all the company names and place names and people names um but yeah it's i highly recommend it if you're a cyber person i mean just from the technology aspect it's also a really good tv show otherwise but just a fair warning, it's a kind of a slow spin up to, to get to where it's cool, uh, but it's worth the wait. You know, you got to get a few episodes in, I think, before it gets awesome. All right, moving on. All right. All right, so different than a pen test, uh, next topic is uh, vulnerability scanning. And what tools do you use to do this some of the tools are actually pretty simple some of them we will actually experiment with um and a lot of these tools in fact almost all the tools are freely available one way shape or form or another um in the old days you know when i started working in it a lot of the stuff that i learned how to practically do in my work was really based on self-education and experience more so than anything i ever learned in a classroom this wasn't something you could go to college and study at the time. And, and I want you to think about that. You know, I studied computer science in school and, you know, which is like kind of like circuit level design and programming and coding and computer architecture, for example. Um, but this stuff was just coming into fruition. So like networking was on the rise and I had to learn where I worked, how to install a network on my own. I had to get a book get a roll of cable and a crimper and start building cables and switches and routers and whatever and figuring out how to hook it up without any formal training by the way i just i was already hired and they're like well you're the it guy you hook us up all right well you got to get me some books or something uh or send me to a like a course you know uh and that's how i figured out how to do it uh but then we also started figuring out that we had uh students on campus who were connected to the network that we're figuring out how to compromise our systems. You know, so this is kind of a, a scary scenario. Um, of course, we were pretty clever too. And so we started conducting scans of our own equipment, figuring out, for example, um, you know, what network ports are open on devices. A lot of people have network ports open that they don't need to have open. Um, in the previous class, the IoT class, so, um, who was in that class? Eric, are you the only one from uh, Ashley, right? As we were kind of um, kind of working with some tools there, um, we were running into like some interesting situations, right? Where um, how do you know when a device is connected correctly? Um, is really kind of a good scenario to think about. And when devices connect, you know, we didn't have like simulated labs back there. You would just collect can connect stuff and then you would run like packet tracers and port sniffers and these really primitive tools and they would tell you what ports are open and closed um and i, I go back to that software that we installed where the private and the public settings on the windows firewall were set um and how just a simple setting like that can leave you open to attack right and so generally on a public network you really don't want to open up ports that you would on a private network because you're at a coffee shop, somebody can attack you and then steal your info, get into your bank account, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So there's a bunch of different kinds of uh, tools that we use. Um, and we've gone from this era of really primitive, like open source software that with very specific tools to sophisticated tools that give you these really 
and I'm gonna kind of make these images bigger, right? To give you these big dashboards of information that update in real time. Um, and, you know, I think it's kind of interesting, right? You know, how much the tools have evolved. So Andrew, I see you, you posted a question. Do you recommend uh, when using public unsecured networks to use a VPN or is it even that dangerous in those locations? I'm gonna say it, it, the answer to that is it depends. You know, and, and you guys will learn from me, that's my favorite answer to every question, right? Because it, it almost always applies. It, it depends on what you're doing. You know, generally speaking, if you're on a Wi-Fi connection, let's say at a coffee shop and you want to log into your bank account, the SSL connection that is going from your machine to the bank is really already encrypted and really should be secure, you know? Um, if you're really that kind of paranoid, what I would recommend is use your phone and disconnect from the Wi-Fi, right? And same, the same kind of you know advice I give to anybody, like really if you're at a place of work, you shouldn't use the work Wi-Fi if you're doing anything personal. You should be on your own data plan. Um, a VPN is a good choice though. Um, so, you know, we haven't even broached that topic yet, but a VPN is basically a piece of software that establishes a secondary secure connection that you tunnel all your traffic through. The only points that can really be attacked are the entry point and the exit point, right? But they're still vulnerable. I don't want you to think you're completely secure by doing that. I am uh, a user of VPN on a couple different levels. So here at Gateway, we have VPN clients that we use for connecting to certain campus resources. So for example, when I manage our servers for the data program and the web program, I have to connect via VPN before I can do my admin work. Um, if I'm doing, um, I'm not sure how to say this, um, maybe not quite so legal file downloading or whatever, <laughs> um, I use VPN software always when, you know, when I'm on my home uh, internet, you know. Uh, there's certain, you know, so for example, a lot of people use VPN, for example, um, when you watch Netflix and you're here in the United States, um, you get certain access to certain content. But if I log in with a VPN through a different country, like over in Europe, I may get completely different content on Netflix using the same account, by the way. Um, so that's, that's one reason a lot of people use VPNs, like they'll VPN over to like France. And then France gets, hey, they got all the seasons of the show. I can't get all that on Netflix at home, right? So that, you know, um, that's an example. But you know what? Our, you know, a lot of people use it for uh, everything. I have been considering uh, paying into a service uh, to just route everything I do through VPN. I've, I've thought about that just for security. Uh, I haven't pulled the trigger on it, but I use some, some private services um okay so yeah you're you're talking about like yeah i am familiar with the technologies you're talking about um yeah the the ios beta is kind of like a new paradigm that they're trying to, to put in it, it's just it's really just a different set of protocols actually uh andrew um and different vpn tools use different protocols the one that that i like and use for myself is this one just kind of I'm doing a little bit of a plug for them uh, you can see right now it's flipped off it's a it's a free download I did a lot of research before I selected this service and they basically give you 10 gigs of data uh, on this service uh, each month right uh, I usually burn through that pretty quick if I'm if I'm doing stuff so I'm kind of selective when I use it and then I think the yearly cost on it's like 40 or 50 bucks, you know? So I've, I'm like, yeah, maybe it's worth it, you know? And then I can just leave it on all the time or whatever. Um, but it allows me to, you know, you'll notice some, some locations are grayed out uh, and some are not. Um, you know, I can connect to all these different countries. So like I can connect to Germany and France and whatever. If I pay, I can connect to all the other ones. And so, what does that it gives you actually a lot of interesting advantages right you know uh, another interesting advantage is not just getting netflix content content that you don't otherwise get but also getting information that is filtered from you from being in this country 
you know. So if you have the naive assumption that you're getting all the news, the real news all the time, it's not like that, folks. You know, it's different if I if I go to the BBC website from the U.S. to get the news, and if I go to England to get the news, or if I go over to India to get the same news from the same website, it will give me completely different content. And it's something to really think about. Um, and so that you know, it's a tool. You know, I, I consider it kind of a tool. It's not necessarily for nefarious purposes, by the way. All right, let's let's uh, keep going here. Um, yeah, if you do a, a, a scan like this, um, it get it can be pretty intensive and actually take a lot of time. Um, there's a bunch of different tools that you can use, and I, I really don't want to hit every one of these single bullets, but you know, you can use different approaches. Uh, some of this, the scans are completely transparent to the network and really have no effect. Other scans can really lock things down. Um, I think, um, all right, so these are kind of like questions that you ask. I, I, I have a one really interesting story. Are any of you having classes with Wendy Klemp? Nobody yet? Okay. Um, but interestingly, um, and actually this is kind of sad because I've been like, in IT for so long and teaching for so long that some of our instructors here at Gateway are my former students. <laughs> you know, so you know it's kind of like put you know makes your gray hair grow grayer. Um, very interestingly, uh, about I don't know, nearly 20 years ago, I was teaching at the University of Phoenix in Brookfield, Wisconsin, teaching network networking basically uh, on a master's level, and Wendy Klemp was one of my students. Um, and we did like really interesting experiments back then in the classroom on the network. We sh totally shouldn't have been, but we were, you know, basically doing port scanning and pen testing and and you know basically all the, all the stuff we're talking about here. And back then the security was so lax, we were able to take remote control of a student's computer in the next classroom over, and write a file onto his hard drive, put it in the startup folder so that when he booted up next time, we put in, hey, we hacked your system, you put this in the startup folder, you should put a password on your account, et cetera, et cetera. You know, I mean, that was just kind of like one of the things we did to kind of demonstrate so that, you know, we would never do that these days. That's way obtrusive and uncool. I'm surprised they didn't get fired for it, <laughs> you know, but um, it was really a great learning experience. And it also shows you like how important it is to really secure your systems. All right. There's a bunch of different tools that we use to gather the information. So you do all this scanning and you gather information. A, a lot of times one of the big problems is what do you do with all the information and then what does that all mean, right? Because you, you, you grab all this raw data. So like we'll look at like a tool called Wireshark and maybe some of you are already familiar with it. And it basically allows you to capture network traffic and then look at it. But looking at a bunch of raw data often is very difficult to kind of pull together. So what, what often happens is we use tools like SIEM to basically put it on a dashboard so we have some sort of like a, a visual indicator of, hey, things are good, things are bad, these are how many things are going wrong. Um, and that's actually a really kind of whole area of development. And Becky, I'm looking at you now because you're a data analytics student. You're not, you're not with all these other people who are network and cyber students. And I'm hoping now that you're starting to see the connection between like what these people do and why it's important for us. Because like one task you might be tasked with is, you know, visualizing this type of data, right? And pretty important. Um, so those tools really become pretty important, um, usually more on the management level on this stuff than rather than the nitty gritty part of it, but important nonetheless. Um, another term, uh, threat hunting right and this is like kind of like the fodder for a lot of like tv shows and movies by the way you know it's like hey i detected this weird activity so i was i was watching this really goofy show on netflix the other day called pine gap you know just gave it a shot and it kind of like one of these things and one of the one of the computer geek analysts in there noticed that like their thermostats were malfunctioning and he attributed it to well, a thermostats connected to our server and if it never malfunctions, and if it malfunctioned for 20 minutes, that indicates we were hacked. So he went through the logs and he figured out all the stuff, you know. So he he was basically threat hunting, but he did it in kind of a, um, an unusual way. So in other words, 
um, it's not just like using some technological tool. It's also kind of using your intuition or clues that are left that tell you that something's wrong. So we should check this, you know, and that's kind of what he was doing. He was, he was threat hunting in the show. And I thought it was kind of uh, a neat little tie in with the material. All right. So we're in the home stretch here with the, with the PowerPoint, by the way. The, the cybersecurity uh, resources here, they have a whole list of them. So I'm going to kind of flip through them really, really quick. We do have a bunch of different what we call frameworks, you know, basically um, structured ways to kind of do these threat assessments is really kind of a way. Uh, and you'll notice we have a, a bunch of different organizations here. Uh, some of them are really important ones. Uh, the NIST is a really big one. I, actually, all of these are, are really big. And, and a lot of them have frameworks for checking security. Um, and so that's pretty important to know. Um, you know, notice that, uh, you know, they, they list the, uh, the NIST uh, framework here, but they have kind of like this, you know, these group of functions that they kind of pool together. But notice kind of like, you know, identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover, you know, kind of catchphrases, and you can read about that more in your readings. Um, but they have, you know, it, it indicates that somebody sat a long time and thought about, like, how do we do this? How do we set it up so it doesn't get um, something bad doesn't happen? If something bad does happen, how do we fix it? Right? And, and there's, there's systems in place. Um, in some cases, we do have industry regulations. Education is one of these. So we, we face this problem at Gateway all the time. So when our cyber students were hacking the network, you can understand why our, our IT department freaked out because they're bound by industry regulations. Say, hey man, we got HIPAA FERPA here and, and like you guys are hacking on the network where we have student like stuff. This is really, really bad. And if you, get, if you guys actually hack our system, then we lose all this funding, you know, from the federal government, state government, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so depending on the kind of industry you're in, uh, there's regulations in place, sometimes uh, local, uh, state, federal, or international. Um, the medical industry has a big issue with this too. Been a lot of cyber attacks on medical institutions, and maybe you guys have heard of some of them. And, you know, so for example, uh, ransomware is a big one. You know, ransomware typically is, happens like this. Uh, somebody gains access to the network or to a file server, um, takes a, maybe the contents of the file server or a database and encrypts it so you can't access it anymore, and then puts up an egg screen saying, hey, you got to pay a ransom for us to unlock your files. You know what happens at a lot of hospitals when that happens? Yeah. And uh, Andrew, I think you're typing it right now. A lot of hospitals are like, yeah, they pay. Yeah, you know, because it's like, hey man, I need that scan. I got to do surgery. I, if I don't see that scan, I, you know, all right, just, just pay the million dollars and let's move on. It doesn't even mean that they fix the vulnerability. That That's the scary part. Um, so it's really kind of interesting, interesting to watch. There's been a lot of really famous scenarios um, a number of years back where Target got hacked really bad. Um, that's like a case study in a lot of IT courses, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then, you know, we have legislations um, and, and, and why I'm going to focus on this one a little bit. Um, yeah, absolutely, Andrew. And uh, this is kind of interesting because here in the U.S., we're arguably we should probably be the most advanced on, on some of these issues. We are not. Europe actually leads us uh, with a lot of legislation to protect the privacy of individuals and, and not necessarily from hackers, but from the companies that we get our IT services from. So if you're using like Facebook or Microsoft or Amazon or Google or whatever, right? A lot of those companies have questionable data sharing practices um, and, uh, and often um, it's the Europeans that pass laws and regulations or fine these big companies billions of dollars or euros whatever um, and then you know it you know like every time we go to a website and I just want you to think about this like you saw it earlier I went to a website and asked me to like verify what cookies I'm allowing right and I usually turn off all the ones that share personal data because I don't want them to have it, right? Um, that is happening because of European legislation, 
not because of anything happening here in the states. Isn't that kind of interesting? I think eventually um, California has adopted many similar policies, and it's always California that leads us, it seems. And I think eventually it's going to filter into the rest of the U.S. But there's some really progressive policies happening in Europe. So, for example, where uh, users of big IT systems can, for example, completely delete all their tracks. So if you want to like remove your profile here in the U.S., let's say you go to Google and cancel your account. If a court walks in and hands you uh, Google a subpoena, Google can pull all your stuff up from backups, even if everything was deleted. They can pull it up from their backups and share it with the courts. In Europe, when they delete you, they delete you completely. You're completely expunged. Now, I don't know if that's good or bad, right? I mean, we can, you can have a big ethical argument about it, but often, unfortunately, the legislation lags here in the United States, but is really progressive in Europe in particular, uh, for whatever reason. I, I, I don't know what, what the philosophy is that drives it there. Um, there are a bunch of standards also. So like, you know, they mentioned like uh, payment card industry. Uh, so like credit card processing now would never happen like it did at Home Depot, like I was talking about. Um, if people are, are they are pumping uh, credit card transactions over a network, but all the terminals are secure. All the network connections are secure and preferably isolated. Um, and those are moving pretty quickly forward. Um, a lot of, um, you know, you know, vendor specific things too, for different reasons. Um, we have a lot of these issues uh, on the Gateway campus too. Uh, very interesting kind of sideline. You know, all the people who teach here at Gateway are given laptops, you know, myself included. Um, however, I, I'm teaching IT and software, and I often have to demonstrate to people how to install a piece of software. Um, Gateway, when they give out machines to their instructors, normally, like if I was an English teacher, they'd hand me a laptop. I am not able to install software on it or do updates or change anything. Um, but us IT people, when we got locked laptops, we were like, what the hell are you doing to us? How am I going to show somebody how to install a VM when I can't even like update Windows? If you can kind of feel uh, where I'm going with that. So they came up with a scenario that basically we don't get full network access uh, to ne share network resources with our instructor laptops. And I, you know, folks, I'm totally fine with that. Some people are like, well, I can't print. I'm like, oh, well, I don't print anyhow, <laughs> you know? So, so there's kind of like these weird things and that happens often uh, internally. Um, you know, where, where do you, you know, frankly, folks, where do you learn about all this stuff? Um, you know, the CompTIA Security Plus book is actually a really good start, believe it or not. Um, but a lot of it is self-education. Um, the other thing that I always tell my IT students is as you kind of delve into this field for the first time, there's a different kind of uh, impetus for all of us in IT that are learning these advanced topics. And, um, you know, I, and I speak from experience on this, I can't rest on what I learned, you know, 20 or 30 years ago uh, when I was in school uh, and apply those same techniques now. Some of them, okay, still apply. But I have to constantly be learning, and that's really what we're saying here. And where do you learn about this stuff? You know, all of these things, you know. So, um, you know, the, the security organizations, you go to conferences, you read, 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 you know. And, and I'm going to focus on that. If you're not, like, really good with, like, reading and keeping up on current topics, you got to really change that mindset. In IT, uh, working IT professional, and you guys really need to tune in on this, you need to be reading the trade publications daily. You need to be looking at like the technology page of your favorite news site. You need to be, you know, going to conferences, reading up on things, uh, go to meetup groups. Uh, there's, they're all over our area, by the way, especially up in Milwaukee, down in Chicago, uh, where people talk about these topics and get together. Um, and cutting edge and important information is shared. And you have to be in the know. If you're not in the know, especially in the cyber program, and I'm saying this, you guys will be out of a job quickly. You know, the expectation is you totally have to keep uh, learning. All right, folks, we're gonna take a five minute break and we're gonna come back and dig into one of the exercises. 
So five minutes, I'll see you at 929.